are. Thanks for stopping by. I'm Ben Hayes with Novolux Stereophonic. Come on in. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about, about yourself and about Novolux. Um, I've been living in Manhattan for about seven to eight years. When I moved here, I was heavily involved in the home automation industry, and I was always interested in stereo equipment on the side. So I was kind of working that, and then when the pandemic hit, I decided to, to ramp it up and, and uh, take it full time. So I work part time at SkyFi Audio. Okay, and we, we got over to SkyFi and made a video over there, right? Yep, that's where we met. And so um, I, work, I work there three days a week, and then in the rest of my time, I work on my own collection of receivers and some uh, select customer repairs. That's awesome. Now, when you say uh, collection of receivers, what, 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 is, what is Nova Lux's specialty? So um, I kind of go where the market goes. So what I work on is high-end monster receivers from the late 1970s, so that Power Wars era where the Japanese companies were competing for the most powerful receivers. So... Um, I work on, they're mostly going to be 125 watts per channel and up. And then the other thing that's selling really well on today's market is a high power amplifiers with meters. That's very cool stuff. Very visually, uh, very visually appealing. Mm -hmm. I guess people like that it takes them back to an earlier era. Yeah, there's definitely some nostalgia with these vintage pieces. Um, well, let's start at the bench. All right, now we're at the bench. I have limited space here, uh, so I had to be very efficient with my, uh, with my setup. So I designed this workbench here around a global industrial workbench, which is uh, used for um, industrial like assembly line purposes, but then I purpose built it uh, for my equipment. What do you have right in front of you? What are you working on? This is a Pioneer SX950. Um, this is two steps down from the, from the big boy in the series. So normally I wouldn't work on this model, but I got it in trade from a customer. And I think I'm actually going to restore this one for my sister and her kids. And, and when, when did it come out? This one would be uh, mid to late 70s. That's really cool. That's really cool. And these are from the day where uh, total harmonic distortion was a key, a key spec that they gave? It was, uh, the, it, was, it was there. So back in the 1970s, this was the start of the power wars. And basically the Federal Trade Commission created a, a rule for testing audio amplifiers, which basically geared the entire industry towards um, certain specifications. So they... Uh, began competing on output power and THD spec because everyone had to follow the same rules. There was no more like marketing, you know, cheating and 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 blurring the uh, blurring the edges. Everyone was compared on the same standard, so the manufacturers started building to that. Good. So on the on the left side over here, I have a patch panel. So this is just to keep my bench clean while I'm working on equipment. Instead of having cables draping from each piece of test equipment, everything comes down to one singular location. Okay. Up above that, I have uh, a Rotel DAC. So this is my bench DAC. Um, I use that for feeding test signals from a Sonos Connect, and that gives me a, a single-ended and balanced output for testing music through amplifiers. Above that, we have a Macintosh MC2125. So that's my bench power amplifier. Moving over here, I've got a couple of oscilloscopes. This one's a two-channel. This one's a four-channel. I use them both about equally. Over here, I have a Panasonic distortion analyzer. So this is where I check to verify THD plus N specifications on amplifiers. How, how do the specs usually measure up to what's advertised? Almost all of the 1970s receivers will meet or exceed the, the THD specification by quite a margin. Uh, so for output power, for example, on an SX1250, it's rated at 160 watts, but that will consistently um, go up to uh, around 180 watts before it clips. Okay. Um, and then the THD spec is specced at around 0.05% and it measures around 0.03%. So they, they usually exceed the specification on the, on the ones that are at the top of the series. Almost all of them are from Japan that I work on. I work on Pioneer, Sansui, Kenwood, and Marantz. Those are the, those are the big names. Um, the only American stuff that I guess would have been around during that era would be uh, Macintosh. They had the, the Mac 1900 and I believe the 4100. Um, but primarily the, the, uh, the high-end monster receivers are Japanese built. But, uh, yeah. The Marantz company started in America, but by the time it was around to the 1970s, the company had been purchased from Saul Marantz and productions, uh, production of most of the equipment went overseas. And it's actually funny, that era of Marantz where you had stuff made in California and Japan simultaneously, I find that the Japanese stuff stands the test of time where the American built stuff, for some reason, the quality of components they use, they tend to fail a little bit more and have more catastrophic issues. Um, a signal generator here. So this is my, my main signal generator for generating square and sine waves for doing audio output power and frequency response testing. This is just a bench digital multimeter. So I set DC offset with this uh, soldering equipment here. 
down here is an isolation transformer in Variac. So this is used to monitor uh, current draw on amplifiers. And also I can ramp up and down my voltage. This, this I use a lot when I'm testing tube amplifiers. Okay. And, and then up here, this is a Sencorp uh, SG80. This is for aligning AM and FM tuners, one of the most important aspects of working on vintage receivers. And then the rest of the equipment is kind of just uh, peripheral stuff. So this is a, a, a dummy load for testing audio amplifiers and stuff, and this gives me a scope interface. Analog oscilloscope, I still need to use an analog scope for uh, a number of things. We've got a capacitor analyzer, and, and uh, I guess a pair of totem speakers I use for my bench reference speakers, uh, a pair of totem mites. How did you get involved in, in, in electronics? What spurred it, and you know, how did it progress? Yeah, so I, um, when I was about 18, I, uh, started to get interested in the hi fine I bought my first system. It was some NAD separates that I bought on eBay. It all arrived as a set. I got a preamp, a tuner, and a power amp. And um, I just went crazy from there. I, uh, my dad and I built a rack around that system, which you'll see in a bit. And uh, I just kept kept upgrading. And what would happen is I would, I would get a good deal on a piece and it would need some controls cleaned or something like that. And I just taught myself things little by little. And, and and eventually got to the level where I could do high-end uh, or high-level troubleshooting and repairs, and now to the point where I can deconstruct and rebuild an entire receiver. Pretty cool. So you have a YouTube channel also, right? Yes. And what is the, what is the name of the YouTube channel? The YouTube channel is the same as my business name, Novalux Stereophonics. That's N-O-V-A-L-U-X Stereophonic. So for people who are interested, we have a link to uh, Ben's channel at the bottom of our channel, so you, you can find that right there. What's the next stop in the tour? Uh, let's take a look at the reference rack here. This here is my reference rack. So um, first off, starting with the furniture. Back when I got that NAD system, when I, when I was uh, you know, just getting into this, my, my dad's a contractor and we designed and built this rack together. So this is made out of solid maple um, and all the shelves are suspended on spike supports. On the top, I have an Oracle Delphi. Right. I keep two turntables hooked up all the time because I'm testing uh, preamps that might have a moving magnet and a moving coil funnel stage. So the Oracle is always set up with an MC cartridge, and then I have a Technics SL1200 that I always have an MM on. So before we move on to looking at the receivers, the last part of the reference system is a set of Epos ES14 speakers. Um, these I really like because they uh, don't have too much bass emphasis and they have extremely good stereo imaging. So one of the important things about analyzing amplifiers on a listening test is making sure that they have um, proper imaging and, and don't have a lot of channel, uh, channel to crosstalk. And now to the receivers. All right, so in front of us, this is kind of my bread and butter. This is a Pioneer SX 1250. Uh, this receiver produces 160 watts per channel and it's considered by a lot of people to be kind of the pinnacle of the design and, and audio quality for the Power Wars. Down below that, I have a Pioneer SX 1980. This is the biggest receiver that Pioneer ever built. This one is around 260 watts per channel. And um, a lot of people actually prefer the 1250 over the 1980 because this is just like over the top extravagant and has a lot of power supply issues. This is, this is the top of the line uh, from Pioneer from the 80, the 80 series. What percentage of the stuff that you get in um, is, is too based? Uh, right now I don't have anything in the shop, but it's actually for my repair work, it's about 50-50. What would the, the retail value on those units be? So when I, after they're fully restored, Right now on the market, the 1980 can go 10 grand plus, depending wow. on cosmetic condition. On the 1250, they're a lot more common, but the cosmetic condition is really going to be the big determining factor. So once they're restored, uh, it seems like the starting price is around 32 to 3500 currently, and they go four grand plus if they're mint cosmetically. This unit here is kind of a rare one. This is a Rotel RX 1603. This is a 180 watt per channel receiver, and it's unique in that it's a two piece design. So the tuner and preamp can be physically separated from the power amp chassis with an optional accessory, which I guess would allow you to put the power amp near your speakers and have the tuner pre closer to your listening position. This unit is absolutely huge. We'll take a look at it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's deep. <laughs> it's, it's as deep. deep as it is wide. The asking price that I've put on this one, uh, just as like a comp to some of the other Pioneer stuff that I work on, I've got this one listed at 4,000. Let's go around back and take a sure. look at this. All right, let's take a look at this unit from the back. So as you can see, this thing is deep. And again, about 70 plus pounds. So what happens is right around this point here, you have to take some covers off, but these two chassis will separate from one another. 
And then there's an optional accessory you can get that adds a, uh, like a front plate to the amplifier with a big umbilical cord. So the, they've had to, in order to accommodate this, they've done the connections on the, on the top of the preamp tuner chassis. And then if we look at the back of the amplifier, this is all the terminal um, posts for the speaker outputs. Customers will ask if I can upgrade it to a five-way binding post, but I, I usually don't want to um, negatively affect the value of the unit. So what I've come up with is using a, um, a pin connector and making an adapter cable. So something that, that slides in nice to like a vintage connector like this, but right. then comes out to like a, 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 a banana uh, or a five-way style binding post so they can use a banana cable. So mostly I work on these big monster receivers, but the other thing that's uh, very popular right now is big power amplifiers with meters. So these two pieces are from a series known as Kenwood Supreme. This is a very exclusive, um, you know, low, low build number series from Kenwood. And this, this series is actually what led to the, um, to the founding of the AccuPhase company or Kensonic. This is a stereo power amplifier called the Kenwood 700M. And then the tuner from that series is the 700T. All right, one of the last giant monster receivers I have here in the repair queue is a Sansui G901DB. So this is um, what's called a, a gunmetal or a, a blackface version of a receiver. So back in the day, there was specialized models for military PX. So um, a lot of times an American uh, you know, serviceman deployed overseas would have access to these PX stores and they could buy um, audio electronics. Wow. So this is the PX version of a, a G9000, which is, uh, it's the biggest receiver from that series. I think there's a G9500 that's a little bit bigger and the, the 22,000 and 33,000 are, are, are the two piece version fr from this series. But yeah, this is, this is a big boy. And one of the funny features on this is it has a physical volume limit. So there's this little uh, thing that you can slide down and it physically limits how much you can turn the volume control. So I don't know if this is for like, if you were having a party and you didn't want somebody coming up and cranking <laughs> your system or something yeah. like that, but it's, it's like everything. one of those funny features. And then there's the final question. What are, you, so, what are some of your favorite units of all time? Um, this, this guy up here, the Pioneer SX 1250 is an absolute gem. It is the most fun to work on because of the way it's assembled. Uh, if you want to come up and take a look, I'll actually open this one up quick. I have this whole back section is the power amplifier. So you can see giant toroidal power transformer, uh, an independent uh, capacitor bank for each channel. So this is two 22,000 microfarad caps per channel. Everything in here is modular. So when I go to rebuild one of these, I can pull the power supply, I can pull the protection circuit, work on them out of chassis, and it allows for really clean uh, finished product. So th these are just a dream to work on. Um, pull this top cover. You can just see the attention to detail Pioneer took on this unit. Phono stage is in here, shielded. Okay. And then right. this is your tuner board and your tuning gang. So they've, they've taken the, um, you know, that extra step of shielding all the components inside of this. So this is one of the best constructed receivers of all time. When, once the restoration is done, they test extremely well. They sound great. Um, and they're just built like tanks. These can go and go forever. Excellent. Well, thanks for having us. If people want to reach you, how, how can they find you? Uh, you can check out my YouTube channel, Novalex Stereophonic. You can also check out pictures of the receivers I'm working on on Instagram. And uh, I have a, a Facebook business page if you want to get in contact with me about a restoration project. Thanks. Well, this is super fun. Really got us a chance to look at some of, of the gear that you may not, or your files might not think of every day. Mm -hmm. um, really fun stuff. Thanks a lot, Ben. Thanks for coming.